welcome everybody. Um, I'm Jane Davis. I'm a member of the New South Wales um, AEO committee. Um, and in a moment, I'm going to provide today's acknowledgement to country. As a committee, we wanted to take a, a bit of a new approach to this part of our event. We wanted to carve out a few more moments than usual to deliberately reflect on this process and to make our acknowledgements a more meaningful part of these seminars. And really, for it to be something that actually comes from the heart, um, something that's authentic. So in reflecting on this as an AAS member, um, I was thinking about how I've seen the organisation take leadership on this through strategic and practical actions in its commitment to recognise and acknowledge the history that's behind this acknowledgement, the hurt and the trauma of the past, and I've seen the AES grow as an inclusive organisation that actively recognises the unique place of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples in this country, in Australia. So as a member and a volunteer, I'm really proud to reflect this commitment, commitment by providing today's acknowledgement and, and by doing it in this way. As a personal reflection, um, I also acknowledge that I'm a Brit. A long time ago, I came on holiday to Australia and I thoughtlessly climbed up Airdrop um, and I call it Airdrop, I've never heard of Bullaroo. Then I came to live here and I've lived here for nearly 20 years and I've since then certainly been on my own personal journey of understanding and recognition and it's been quite uncomfortable at times. I also work here at the commission and so I'm really proud to share with you our beautiful acknowledgement to country. It's been written by our own Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander staff members um, and it's quite, it's quite new, it's new to us, this is the first time I've used it. We acknowledge the first peoples of this nation, the traditional custodians of country, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. We value the unique and diverse cultures, languages, sacred and our acknowledged systems, and the important connection to land, water, and country. As we work to promote and protect the human rights of all Australians, we walk with you on your journey for self-determination, for social justice, for respect, and for recognition. We thank the elders, both past and present, for allowing us to continue to care and nurture this great land that we call home. Thank you and welcome. Uh, thanks, uh, thanks, Jen. I think that was uh, very touching and definitely very authentic. So thank you. And and, and as someone who attended the um, uh, evaluation conference, as many of you would have this year in Sydney, one of the things that really struck me and was commented upon by many people was the, the really inclusive approach to uh, um, Indigenous issues throughout the, throughout the conference. Okay, so my name's Greg Masters. Um, I'm also a member of the committee um, and have been responsible for doing some of the coordination of the free events, and, and this is the last one for uh, this year. And can I encourage uh, you to come along to the uh, drinks that will follow at, at 5.30 this afternoon. Um, we have had, a, I think, a really good year of uh, <coughs> free events on, the, on these Thursdays. We've tried to put in practice the interactive uh, request that people uh, gave us um, to make them more, less you know, talky and more involved and uh, we'll, be, we'll be doing that today as well. And one of the other suggestions we've uh, taken on board is to, that we're trialling filming today. That does mean that people that are in the front here might, uh, might get filmed peripherally. So if any of you are uncomfortable with that, um, you can get behind the camera line. Um, I'm saying that because we wanted to avoid the technicality of filling out forms and disclaimers and all that sort of stuff. So we're doing it in a, in a less formal way. But if you are in any way uncomfortable, it's, it's going to be posted uh, subject to the AES in Melbourne's approval on the AES website. So it's not going to be uh, broadcast more broadly than that. Um, just a quick uh, overview of the program. We've, the committee has actually had a go at trying to program next year's activities. So I'm going to go through these very quickly, but to give you a tantalising glimpse of what's happening. In February, we'll be talking about evaluation in Buddhism, which is a rerun or an extension of a paper that was very well received at the com conference. Uh, we'll be looking at a paper around complexity and uh, how to evaluate complex programs in March, April, about evaluation capacity building, and that and that will also those uh, those three papers are all. Uh, extensions of what was presented at the conference. 
Um, in May, we're doing something I can't read. Oh, I know what it is. It's the, the unconference format. Um, uh, you know, bring your, the evaluation challenges that you keep you awake at night. Uh, ethical dilemmas in June. Um, Indigenous evaluation issues in July. Um, economic evaluation in August. The conference, which you'll all be attending in Brisbane, is on in September. And we'll discuss in October some of the emerging trends from that conference. In November, uh, we'll have, so 12, 12 months from today, we'll have um, evaluation of behaviour change. So some of those topics need to be filled out, but we've got an exciting program ahead and expect you all to turn up and all to become members because one of our goals is to be, have more members than... Victoria. You got it. <laughs> got it. So we're, we're on the way. So uh, if, if you're not a member, I expect to see you become a member. Otherwise, shame. Shame. <laughs> so I'm going to hand over to George. We're, taking, we're attracting... Thank you, Bruce. Uh, thanks for the invitation to, uh, to speak again, and so thanks for coming along to listen. Uh, I'm talking today um, about a topic that popped up, or didn't just pop up, it was fairly prominent throughout the, um, the conference. And by the way, I will make my slide presentation available um, after this, so you don't need to take notes or um, if I want to be think about it. Um, <coughs> And it was a, it's, a, it's a topic I've been working with and on over the past few years um, in a whole range of spaces. And I, I thought it was timely, given that interest from the conference, to sort of uh, talk about those issues um, and, and rubrics. And just to start, let's start with an example. Um, a rubric has a couple of elements to it. Obviously, it's got a scale um, that measures some change or progress. It's an ordinal scale. It's not just different, it's progress in some sense. Um, and that's, that in itself is not a whole lot different to any standard kind of survey question, for example. What makes this a rubric is the addition of these statements that clearly describe the conditions that have to hold for someone to give this rating or that rating. So it's the use of these clear descriptors for each point on the scale that make this a rubric. So you've probably seen them. Just generally, how many people have tried to construct rubrics in their evaluation or other work? Yeah, just by the show of hands, you can see how common they're, they're becoming. And we might talk openly about your experiences and what you've learned from them. Now, I've used rubrics in a whole range of areas, um, ranging from measuring regulatory maturity to behaviour change to assessing capability development, um, capability training, a uh, whole number of different evaluation and evaluation-like contexts. And what I've noticed as I've tried to construct them myself with clients or reading the literature and what's out there is that there's some common underlying scale points that define the rubric scale. But Rarely do you see them all in one place. So what I'm presenting to you is not something grand or innovative or new, it's just pulling together some common threads that appear across a range of rubrics in practice. So before I get to that, just some other examples just to illustrate the use. Um, people have arrived at rubrics through different in different different disciplines and different practices and often call them different things. There's a some people may have heard of goal attainment scales, which grew out of uh, psychology and especially uh, criminal justice and rehabilitation and mental health. And they use these kinds of scales with descriptors attached to them for each of what, what each of these mean. Um, similarly, those of you at Commonwealth Agency here, the Australian Public Service Commission has rubrics for measuring capability development across a whole range of domains and so consistent underlying meaning for the points on this graph. So there's just some other examples. There's a whole heap of them that you can come up with. So what, as I said, what I want to draw out is are there some consistent scale points on these rubrics that you find that maybe provide, give us the basis for a universal scale? You may notice in the title I've put a question mark at the end of that because that might be something we can discuss if I'm stretching things too far here. Um, but we, we can have a discussion about that uh, down the track. Now, obviously, one of the common scar points you see is what I've called fully realised. The outcome is there in its full form, whatever that outcome is, whatever that, that you want to see. 
Um, interestingly, the one that rubric I showed right at the start doesn't really have that. Uh, and I find that's a big limitation when the rubrics are used. So if you were doing an evaluation, is good good enough for the end of the excellent to be good? <laughs> uh, if nothing else, I think for evaluation purposes, a rubric that has the outcome defined in its fully realized state is the starting point. Because it's going to have to do the rest of it, but it's also to have the utility in making evaluative judgments. So you can think about what that might mean for the given outcome. Obviously, at the other end of the scale, or not necessarily, but one other common point is it's just not there. It's absent. It's kind of not happening, whatever it is. That's a fairly easy one to define. Interestingly, you might think that those two points define the, big, the top and bottom of the scale, but when I've worked with rubrics, I occasionally find points that exist beyond those. For example, something might not be happening, the outcome is not present, not just because of benign reasons, but because there's something active in, actively hindering it coming about. So that cannot, those kind of things, those oppositional forces can be either internal, lack of motivation, lack of attainability, or it can be external. If I did that, it would kill my career, kind of things. <coughs> Systems don't exist to support me doing that. So those kinds of, it's just not, not only not happening, there are barriers to it. Feel free to jump in if you've got questions or comments or see things like this as well. At, at the other end of the scale, some, this I, I really gave me an insight when I was doing some work for the Commonwealth Department of Environment and Energy on measuring regulatory maturity. When we were talking about where they want to be down the track, they said in 10 years' time, we don't want to just be turning up to international conventions and learning what other countries are doing. We want to be setting the standard for regulatory practice in this area. So they don't just want to realise the outcome, they want to be leading it or innovating. Leading and innovating are not exactly the same things, but you get a sense of that. They're, they're, they're doing something new or, or establishing best practice. So they, they, they're kind of interesting points on the scale you sometimes see, and I think that can be very meaningful in some evaluation contexts. In some contexts, you may not actually want this. I've had managers saying, well, if, if someone, if we actually got to that, we're wasting resources. We're happy just getting here. We don't want to get there. We could better use our resources. So it's not always progress. You have to define it in its context, but it's good to know. And obviously, the in between is the meaty part of the scale, which is you're on the way. At the very least, the common points on rubrics that I've seen are it started but really early days, beginning but limited. Or we're making progress but there's still some work to do. Obviously, you can expand between here and here to more points on the scale than that, but they're the two I see most commonly as a minimum. Now, what defines movement along that part of the scale, usually I've found have usually resolved along two dimensions. One is the breadth or the reach of the program or whatever it is you're doing. If you want to raise capability among this group of people, but we've only really got this far yet, we're still gonna do it for this group. You haven't reached your whole target audience yet. The other dimension that can decide how far along this scale you've moved is quality. Okay, so we've reached everyone, but we've done it really badly. Um, in an evaluation context, that can often be also determined if you've developed a, a nice outcomes hierarchy and outcomes chain. So we need to raise awareness first, and then with awareness we can increase knowledge, and then after knowledge we'll get some skills happening. So those points in your outcomes hierarchy or outcomes chain can define the points of the scale to which you move. <coughs> um, that's 
that's the other way of doing it. So just to give you an example, I don't know if anyone would stop for any comments first about with all of that. Yeah. Just, just for thinking about, that, so what are we describing or what are we rating the outcome, right? Uh, it works well, but from opposed, I've, um, how are we describing the outcome when we say opposed? It looks like it's something opposed to reaching the outcome rather than describing the outcome itself. Yeah, it, it, you're right. It's not the outcome, it's not the negative, it's, you're not going in the wrong direction, it's something, it's an active barrier to it. So it is, strictly speaking, a mathematician would say, no, no, you're, it's not the same thing in this scale. But for evaluation purposes, I've often found that, yeah. especially, I'll talk about towards the end, from a, um, a decision-making point of view, knowing this is important along with knowing that. Couldn't the oppose also be a realisation that the outcome's not necessarily a good direction? Like there are other directions that are better? Could be, it could be, uh, yeah. Then this, this gives you a measure, like any other measure, what you then do with it, mm. how you interpret it, the evaluative judgment you place on it is up to you in the context, but certainly gives you a start to thinking about that. So just an example, um, if you're interested in bringing about a certain kind of behaviour change, I know we're getting a year's time, we're going to talk about this in more, more depth, uh, but just, <laughs> uh, you can sort of see the kind of statements you might come up with. Um, this is from a direct example, actually, that I developed for sustainability for you. Um, what, what you might, like the terminology you might use for the labels um, if you were using a rubric to measure behaviour change. Does anyone have got any questions or comments on any of that while it's up there? I can't go into them. Just in so, over to you. On your tables, you have a bit of paper. You all turn it, someone on your table turns it over. What I want you to do, we want to develop a rubric collectively here that's going to measure this aspect of evaluation, practice, and culture. I actually have done this for the Western Australian Public Sector Commission before I did a capability building workshop. I developed a rubric with them and we applied it and it allowed me to focus the kind of training and capability development I did on the basis of it. I want to see what you come up with. So each on your table, so I'll take this one for example, I want this table to come up with a statement for leading or innovating as their point on the scale for measuring this quality. So each of you does a different point on the scale. So start by talking among yourselves, get to know each other, write something down, and then when you're ready to show it to the rest of us, go to this Mentimeter link with this code and type it in because it will then come up on the screen for us to be able to talk about it. Yeah. So there you go. <laughs> <laughs> we'll take
is that they're done developed collaboratively um, and who does that we can talk about it another time but that's one of the the aspects on that people find attractive um, this table i think you guys developed this thing or just to read it out in case it's hard to see the consistent use of previous evidence to inform design evaluating thinking test options development of a logic model to increase the quality of program design so if that was all happy, if you could go in and say, in my organisation, this statement describes the situation, we can say that the outcome, of whatever that outcome is, uh, using evaluation for program design is fully realised. Yeah. Any other comments or thoughts? Don't pick it apart. We're not here to sort of say you've got it wrong or you've got it right. <laughs> um, so what other things that pe other people may have included in, in if they were designing that point on the scale fully realised? I would have a who in there. Like who you would have a who. Yeah, who's yes. doing consistently. Yeah. And the discussion about the unit of analysis, the point I was going to make later, but that's a, that can be a very tricky one. Are you talking about individuals? Are you talking about an organisation? Um, what, what is the unit of analysis that you really identify? Something around quality of evaluation and which, like what you were mentioning before, should be used you know, for every program and good evaluation. Right, it's used for every evaluation. So the word quality is in there, but made more specific it's about every program is doing this. Okay, I'll jump to the second one, which is the use of evaluation for program design, leading or innovating. So we had two, two tables there. Just interesting to see what they came up with. Um, evaluation plan before implementation, linked to intended purpose, impact and outcomes are defined and measurable, qualitative quantitative measures, theory is peer reviewed, 
evaluation features of program design recognised as authority. Um, whereas this one over here, establishing a best practice model example, other organisations adopt that best practice. Program designers valuing and actively advocating sort of future program design. Quite a little bit different. Again, it's no right or wrong. But just reflecting on them, I kind of think this one captures the idea of learning or innovating a little more than this one. This is almost fully realised without really being innovation. So it's a suggestion to it. And again, it's it's why it's a it's a collaborative process because it sometimes takes a bit of toing and froing to get there. But I think certainly, especially in this one, I think it's got that idea of best practice or doing something beyond what's minimally required or for the outcome to say if it's a success. Any other comments or things that you would have thrown in there that you're not seeing in that, in that little list? For innovation or, or leading? Let's go to number three. Oh, so this is opposed. <laughs> the whole language of evidence-based practice is dismissed. <laughs> it's pretty straightforward. <laughs> we just don't want to hear it. Um, using program evaluation is seen as devaluing expertise, <laughs> using practice wisdom. Yeah. <laughs> Bullshit evaluation. <laughs> so, I've been doing it for 20 years and I just know. Um, so they are getting both different. I think they both capture something of maybe all of our experiences. <laughs> <laughs> so I can see some hard bitten experience there. We had some system stuff, George. So, oh, okay. Um, okay. Where, oh, we, in one of these, you had some more. Well, yeah, I guess so. Yeah. 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 Um, where there's a whole, if there's a design process uh -huh. that we're working to, and it doesn't include using evaluation findings in the design process, so if you follow the template you're supposed to follow, you're not going to do it. So, there's a default. Right. Within the organisation, right, which means you've, you've, you've got to vary from the playbook in order to do it. Right, so you've got to change something else before you can even get on the path. Yeah, yeah. So if, if you do what you're told, then that doesn't involve using evaluation in the design process. Okay. Any last thoughts on what it means to be opposed? It was actually tricky to get to oppose because sometimes we were doing that to accent. Yeah. Yeah. The difference between yeah that really something that goes against yeah. versus not being not using evaluation. So our partners usually think it's benign. We just don't never thought about it. Never occurred to us. We never it just didn't occur that kind of thing. Uh, beginning but limited. Emerging and inconsistent knowledge, culture, and practice of evaluation. Evaluation is sometimes being used in program design, but may be limited with lack of awareness, lack of resource, or lack of formal process. So, yeah, again, a bit of both. This one sort of unpacked it a little further, and it, it identifies some of the areas which you'd need to beef up if you were going to get through the depth and bottom of the scale. Any comments, thoughts, especially for those of you who developed it, what was in your mind as you came up? Okay, and the last one, making progress. There is a, an awareness of evaluation components, the benefits of evaluation and how they piece together. So it's only awareness at this point, which is interesting. Um, some or all evaluation components are used in program design, but the use may be flawed or selective. Um, use of evaluation is underway, but inconsistent with five. Quality is improving. But more training is required, most but not all might have lost up in there. When I develop the Poison Sky, I tend to always look for 
adverbs like inconsistently and try and change that into a verb of what, what is inconsistent. You know, it's only done in half the number or few or so you need to try to identify this. But as an, as an exercise, I don't know what you think of every one of the discussion now as an exercise in getting started with this. What are your any thoughts or comments? Ignoring the actual detail of what we just done. I've got a question, George. Sure. Um, is around so we've got one scale for the use of evaluation for program design there when you have drafted up something there. Um, how do you make decisions whether to unpack that? So because some people talk about training, for example, and there might be training or it might be culture and there might be something about skills or, um, you know, we could probably yeah. a few other things. Big question, actually, is that so when you use one sort of global scale for everything, or at what point do you break it up into multiple scales? Because I've seen some of that stuff that we were just talking about even broken down and they'll have a separate rubric for the quality of program logics. Um, so each thing you add in a statement could itself become the subject and the evaluative judgment. And now, it really depends on the decision making always and the need and the context. So one, what one table said, oh, it's hard to do this without knowing context. What's the organisation? What's the thing? Is it a big government department? Is it a small NGO? Those kinds of issues are really important. What's the need? Usually I find that decision about having one or a small number of rubrics or really breaking up into more detail depends on if you find yourself looking at a statement and saying, well, yeah, I can see that we're kind of here, but I can see we're also kind of here. When you have that situation, often you've tried to pack in too many criteria into one statement. Now, there are some reasons for doing that, um, and those kinds of statements then just become archetypes. No individual case will perfectly conform to that point on the scale. But, and so you say, which is the closest fit to your situation? But if it's still a problem and people are still struggling, say, well, I like both of these. You've probably got too many dimensions for the thing you want to measure in one scale, and you need to break it up into multiples rubrics and then you try and synthesize across them later on once you've got the measures. So that's the kind of consideration there. Any other comments about just just on that, do you ever get around that by offering like another field that says other or explain why you chose that field? Okay. Good point. <laughs> just so happens. <laughs> and it wasn't me. I think there are limits to rubrics however well you construct them. And what I find really useful, actually, if you do construct them well, you can follow up and add really good, intelligent, qualitative measures to them. And for and I'll note that it's a conditional question. So if someone does kick a post, you can have a filtered question that says, well, what is it about this your situation that led you to that? And you can add specific questions to that point on the scale that unpack gives you that qualitative information. So again, rather than trying to dump it all into the descriptive statements, maybe make that simple and follow up with qualitative questions. And those qualitative questions can be around any or all of these things. Um, what are the barriers to moving up the scale? Are you found yourself in beginning? What would help you get to this kind of situation? Um, what has helped you, what were effective activities or programs that got you to this point on the scale? What are other enablers of change? Like management systems, all those kinds of things. What would you need in the future? What, what are the future needs you would anticipate? Um, and lastly, you can start asking about downstream outcomes from this. Okay, we've got our tra evaluation training sorted out and a capability to leave. How did that affect or improve other aspects of organisational performance? So adding any or all of these follow-up qualitative questions really then gives you very rich data 
um, that might get offended with your judgment. Does that, does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, any thoughts or comments there? I'm just wondering, George, if there's room in the rubrics for, I guess, the unexpected benefits or outcomes. How do we accommodate those? Yeah, I guess you could. In, in a sense, this this talks about it. This might capture it. Um, yeah, but again, it doesn't preclude any, any other forms of uh, questions you might add to it. Um, the language around opposed and absent, I've seen, I, I like having it all out on the table. But I've seen in some organisations a reluctance to give um, words to, to that. And so in one large New South Wales government department, there's a um, <laughs> framework that's used for self-assessment um, across hundreds and hundreds of different sites. And it goes, delivering is, is the first category, and then excelling is the third category. And then I reckon they ran out of puff because the middle one's called sustaining and growing. But there's nothing, there's no definition of what sits to the left yeah. of delivering. So when those sites do self-assess, they can self-assess as uh, this fourth category, which is known in the trade as working towards delivery. <laughs> right? But there's no descriptors for what that is. Because there could be as many reasons for being working towards delivering as there are different places. But I just wanted to share that as an example. Yeah, yeah. It's kind of half a full rubric, yeah. but it's been, well, that, that's leaps and bounds ahead of, of not having anything mm. for, for self assessment. Right, right. So, and it certainly, you know, I, I prefer having it all out on the table, but that's me. And yeah, I'm, no, I'm, I'm, I'm not the person doing self assessment. When, when, I, when I did the WA Public Sector Commission one, they knew they were already having problems with their data people. <laughs> and if we ask people about problems with our data system, it's just gonna it's gonna scratch a saw that's already pretty raw. Um, so so um, yeah, the sensitivities around that point on the scale I might want to think about and change the language somehow or assess it in some other way. But yeah, these are just, this is all just suggestions. Um, like I said, there's a question mark at the end of the title of this thing. It might not be completely universal. Um, other than that. Some issues with using it, I know which just makes it a little bit different. Um, they've just not come. Sometimes you can use these where you can construct your rubric, you go through this process. I find that it makes self-assessment a little easier and clearer because there's an underlying consistency for the scale of points. Um, if you go back to that very first one, that I had, if you actually look at this, the only difference between excellent and good is the word very strong. It's kind of shifted the subjectivity in, about whether you call yourself good or excellent into the descriptor. The descriptor hasn't actually minimised the subjectivity in my opinion. Uh, so you don't need to, because these aren't really anchored in anything that people can easily grasp. Whereas I think this kind of scale, it's a lot more intuitive, it's a lot clearer about what it is. So, um, oops, sorry. So if you make self-assessment, there's still subjectivity to it, but at least it's consistently subjective across genes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, it also, uh, you can also use it to allow other people to make an assessment. If you've got a field team, say, all having to use the same rubric, because there's a consistency in the underlying scale, I think it would reduce the greater reliability, or experts can use it to, to make performance or whatever it is. Um, or you can use some hybrid scoring um, uh, between self-assessment and, and, and expert or other, others assessing. The other thing is you can use the rubric itself as a data collection instrument. You give it out and say, please rank yourself. Sometimes that can be hard or it can be confrontational, as Duncan has, uh, has mentioned. The other way of doing it is you can construct a series of survey questions. For example, they might just be simple yes, no questions. So these things happen in your organisation. It's a whole long list. And depending on the sum of which yeses and which noes, you then impute what that means for where they sit on the rubric. 
so that people filling out, giving you a to C survey question, you then amass it and synthesize it to determine where that, that sits. Um, and you can bring in other data. So some of the statements might say, at least 50% of our programs use this, and you, you just get that from administrative data, for example. So it doesn't all have to be assessment in that sense. So there's a range of approaches to actually determining where units of analysis sit on a scale which you can construct. Lastly, just some closing observations we might then open up for discussion. As I've said, I flagged it with a question mark, but I have been surprised myself the range of applications. Again, maybe I've become a cult and I'm pushing something a bit too far. Um, but I'd be interested in hearing from your particular context and the kind of outcomes and, and evaluations you work with, whether you think, oh yeah, that could have helped here, that could have been worked in that context, or no, that would never work. Now, I can tell you a situation where I wouldn't use a rubric. It's where there's already well-established measures for something. If I was measuring recidivism for prison rehabilitation, I'm not going to use a rubric. I, I might be, tell me if I'm wrong, people working in the justice space. I think there's reasonably good, reliable measures for that. Um, economic development, obviously good, reliable measures for that. Um, so I think that's one area where I wouldn't push it too far. But it'd be interesting to hear from you where you think it could be used to fill some of the measurement gaps. Um, the units of analysis, which are sometimes different from the units of data collection. What do I mean by that? You might want to analyze government agencies and how well they're doing evaluation. But the unit of data collection are the individuals working in that agency. What, how do you aggregate the information from the individual so you can say something about the unit. Now these are ordinal scales and there's mathematical limitations with adding and, and, and averaging and all of that. But it, it's, is it 50% of people have to say something? Or is it, there's all sorts of issues around that. One of the interesting things about it, and this is the exercise we did where we had different tables giving different statements, is it can expose different perceptions about what's going on or what even outcomes mean among key stakeholders. And that can actually be an interesting thing in itself. So for the Victorian <coughs> Department of Education, uh, did I got them to I got policy officers to rate their practice and evaluation, and I got senior managers to measure the same on the same rubric. And guess what? Anyone anticipate what the results said? <laughs> Yeah, the managers are all crap and how people were to it or? The managers thought things were going well. <laughs> the policy officers are not so much. <laughs> but that allowed a conversation to be had with the managers about, well, this is what you say, but this is what the ground troops say. What, what does that mean? What are you going to do about it, if anything? Um, but at least there was consistency about the base scale that allowed that comparison. And that's why I think having this common <coughs> underlying consistency to the point on scope that allows comparison. <coughs> um, we've talked about the idea of do you have one rubric or multiple rubrics, or that if you have a global scale or break up into dimensions and then synthesize the information yourself separately. And lastly, I want to think the great value I've got out of having these consistent underlying scales is allowed me to link it to performance reporting and decision making. This is something I did with Duncan recently because I was doing stuff with the sustainability in Victoria and I developed a scale and Duncan and I just sat down and said, well, what, did, what would this mean for decision making if you got this point on the scale? So these are the labels we used and sorry about the reading is not great. Um, but for example, if something was absent, so this is capability building among local governments to improve environmental um, regulation and practice. Uh, you would raise awareness and articulate the case for change, introduce the practice into role description of business process, provide work examples and training. So what you do if you find yourself breaking here or here or here, what then follows from it tends to be a little bit clearer. Mm -hmm. So it's linked to decision making is just that little bit tighter. 
and that's I think one of the really attractive ideas. Um, so that's where I'll finish and take any just discussion, comments, thoughts, run through. <laughs> <laughs> Just on that last one, was that were those suggestions about decision making um, or possible responses? Were they developed collaboratively? No, it was back in the night when I just went after that. How is that not collaborative? It tended to Joe when we showed it to them. When I showed it to them, they got really excited about this. Mm -hmm. They really liked this because it's more than just oh, here are the measures, mm -hmm. here are the measures, and what you can possibly then do. I'm just curious, um, what what are the most important things to consider when figuring out how many points on your rubric you're going to have? Good question. Um, well, certainly if I was going to develop a rubric for monitoring purposes, I would probably extend the scale points. Oop, I'd have more between absent and fully realised. If you're monitoring, if you're monitoring, you tend to want to sort of be able to detect fine small changes over time. And so I'd probably have a lot more points here. Um, it really depends on context and, and how much fine grain distinction a people can make when trying to score a rubric, and how much do decision makers need to make to inform their decisions. So there's no, can't give you the, the magic number, but I think this is probably the, the, the smallest set and you expand beyond that depending. I was almost tempted to put a third one in here. There's often beginning, making huge progress and almost there, and sort of halfway there. Mm -hmm. But uh, it's not as common as these two, so I didn't put it in on the universal scale. So can I ask a follow-on question to that? The deeply philosophical question about whether you offer a neutral, a middle, middle neutral position. Well, don't get me started. I, I, I loathe the use of neutral midpoints. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I loathe the agreement and satisfaction scales. I loathe them even more when they have neutral midpoints because I don't know what the hell they are. <laughs> I'm still not sure what it means to be neither satisfied nor dissatisfied. If someone could explain that state of being, it's like a pure smart who spent 20 years on a mountain. Uh, I don't know what it means. Um, I think what's missing really in those is you haven't got off the scale points like it's yeah. not applicable, I don't know, yeah. can't say. And yeah. certainly you would have those here as well. Yeah. Yeah. I should make a comment about a middle point because I'm a real fan of middle points. Mm. Oh. <laughs> Yeah, but even, even with well-worded questions, all the literature on those, this could go in a slightly different direction, but um, <laughs> all the literature on the, those scales, and the classic, of course, is the book like Question and Answers and Attitude Surveys, they, where they do a lot of split half experimental comparison. They tend, that midpoint tends to capture people who are very different. Okay. Measurement theory, People who identify with a point on scale should be consistent in the reason for doing it. That midpoint catches people who do it for different reasons. They do it either because they don't know or are unsure, but also because they're slightly agree, but it's not really strong. So it's or slightly disagree, it's not strong enough that they've pushed the other points on the scale. Well, and that's the argument.